thank you for each and every one that is here with us today. It's always nice to see a rather full sanctuary when we come to worship. It's so encouraging to be together. And right in the midst of all of us, there's Jesus Christ. Amen. He's right here in our midst. You see, that's when he kept showing up after the resurrection. That was the point. When the believers, the body of Christ comes together, he's there. He's right there. He's always with us, but he manifests that truth in a unique way whenever we come together. And he is here with us each and every day. But when we come together, he's here for us and with us no matter what we face. He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. And that's something that we can take hold of. Not just now, but eternally. He is with us. We're going to be in Matthew primarily today. Matthew, fourth chapter. And we're going to talk a little bit about when Jesus Christ went into the wilderness. Matthew 4, verse 1, it says, Then, this is, of course, after the baptism, after Jesus Christ was baptized by his cousin John, then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. We can read in Matthew's account of the temptations of our Lord Jesus Christ in the wilderness. John the Baptist had come out of the wilderness declaring the baptism of repentance and the coming of of the kingdom of God. And you see, John did this to prepare the way for Jesus' public ministry. When Jesus is baptized, that is, he's pointed out. He's pointed out as that one who takes away the sins of the world. That in that baptism, in the baptism of our Lord, when the heavens open and the voice of God is heard and the Holy Spirit descends in the form of a dove upon Jesus, Jesus is being pointed out in that divine moment, as the one, the uniquely born Son of God, who is our Savior, Savior of all humanity. He's pointed out, as John would say later in Matthew 11, verse 3, he said, are you that one that should come? Are you he that should come? Are you the one that we have been waiting for? Here Jesus Christ is, the Messiah of Israel, identified in that divine moment, the descent of the Holy Spirit in the form of the dove and the words of the Father. This is my beloved Son. Here the very Messiah had arrived, bringing within himself the kingdom of God. This is the one of whom the prophets of Israel had spoken of. The very one who is the hope, not just of Israel, but of all humanity. The anticipations, the hopes, the expectations of centuries and generations were now here in the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. This was a very great moment, an important moment. But Jesus' mission, that is the reason he came, wasn't exactly the way the people of Israel had hoped. And you see, Jesus Christ in his ministry and in his life and in his death, and in his resurrection, shows that God had something greater, much broader, much more eternal in mind than what the people of Israel themselves had hoped. In Matthew 4, verse 1, Matthew 4, verse 1, speaking of Jesus after his baptism, then was Jesus led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. You see, Jesus' first action after being pointed out as the Messiah of Israel, his first action wasn't to go to Jerusalem, to the temple, to have a conversation with the religious leaders. Instead, he is driven, that is, led by the Holy Spirit powerfully into the desert. That's where the Holy Spirit led him, into the wilderness. Now understand, this wilderness, the Judean wilderness, was a harsh, windswept, dry place. And in Hebrew cosmology, that is the way the people of Israel saw the world. It was the home and the abode of demonic powers. It was one of the two places that the people of Israel would anticipate meeting demons, whether on the ocean or in the harsh wilderness. It is such a place that Jesus Christ goes powerfully. And in by doing so, he is declaring to the powers of this world that he has come into their own territory to face them. He's letting Satan know 
that I have come to make a change in all of time and in eternity. In the wilderness, we witness through the scriptures the kingdom of God embodied by the person of Jesus Christ that he demonstrates here what has already been true. That the great God is victorious. The conflict of good and evil, light and darkness, in this moment is brought to clarity and much is revealed. The things of this world and the darkness, they tend to obscure and confuse. But the coming of light, the coming of light and the truth of that light, the light of God, makes things plain. It is clear that in the simplicity of the desert, away from all the distractions, the conflict is revealed openly. Satan comes to Jesus. And in the temptations that are very subtle in form, the conflicts are brought to bear, are revealed. You see, this is Satan's methodology. He probes for weakness in a very subtle way. First, Jesus is tempted to turn mere stones into bread. Jesus attempts to go to Satan, um, excuse me, Satan attempts to go Jesus into employing his power, the power of God, for carnal ends, for worldly ends, to satisfy the demands of the flesh. Now there's nothing inherently wrong with being hungry, and nor is there anything wrong with wanting to eat. But the temptation lies in seeing the gratification of the flesh. You see, it's very subtle. He tempts Jesus to eat, but it isn't just satiating hunger. It's the reason that he would use his divine power. And understand, Jesus never used the power of deity for his own advantage, profit, or gain. He always used it for the glory and towards the will of God. You see, Satan moves very cleverly here in the wilderness. And understand, there is a difference between being wise and being clever. Satan is clever, but he is not wise. Always remember that. There's a difference between being wise and being clever. Satan is clever, but he is not wise. Matthew 4, verse 3, he says to Jesus, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become bread. If. See, he wants to insert doubt in the mind of Jesus Christ. If. But you see, Jesus Christ quotes from Deuteronomy 8, verse 2. When he says in Matthew 4, verse 4, Man does not live by bread alone, but by the whole word of God. You see, the kingdom of God is more than just the physical flesh. and Provisions for the physical flesh, they go beyond and above those things. In the second temptation, and understand what is meant by tempt. It means to test. You see, Satan tried to test Jesus' divine power. And here he takes Jesus Christ to the very pinnacle of the temple that overlooks 300 feet below into the Kidron Valley. And he says in Matthew 4, verse 5, If, again, if, if you be the Son of God, cast yourself down, if you be. It is a temptation, again, to measure the divine power of our Lord Jesus Christ, to tempt Him, to use the Spirit of God in accordance with His own needs and His own wants for human purpose. Yet the miracles of the kingdom of God have a purpose beyond self-serving. Jesus uses them to direct people to His Father. Jesus again responds, You will not test the Lord your God. The third temptation is very fundamental. And it is the foundation of all of them. It is the temptation that Satan used upon Adam and Eve, our first parents, the very dawn of human civilization. That temptation to be as God, to be as God. It is the temptation to see oneself in place of God. 
And you see, that really is the whole issue. That is really the whole issue. You see, in eternity past, Satan wanted to be God. He wanted to exalt himself above the Creator. He wanted to exalt himself. And really, Satan was blinded to the truth that he was a slave to his own, to his own power lust. So Satan, believing himself to be quality of God, actually diminishes himself down to being a servant of his own lust and desires. He deludes himself into believing that he can have or should have something that belongs to another to be God. And that is the very temptation of all flesh, to be self-determining, to exalt the self above the needs of others, to exalt the self even above the worship of the great God, to see the self in place of God, to see the one self as the absolute arbiter and authority and measure of everything. When we do this, we are actually worshiping the devil in proxy. And Satan says to Jesus, all these things, all these things I will give you if you fall down and worship me. So that when you look to something else, you're really worshiping Satan, whatever it is. Any idol that we erect in our life, whatever it is, whatever preoccupies our time, whatever we serve, we are actually serving Satan in proxy. See, that's what we're really doing. Jesus would be vested in all the authority and power of this world if he would worship Satan. It is an illusion. It is in trying to appeal to the pride of the flesh and the ambitions of the flesh. Jesus replies, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only will you serve. What Satan was attempting to do was to have Jesus step outside of the will of God to circumvent the very purpose that God had for sending his son Jesus Christ. He was attempting to get Jesus to step outside of the will of the Almighty God. He could have all these things. He could have all the kingdoms of the world. He could avoid the cross. He could avoid all the suffering. He could avoid all of that. That could be circumvented. Satan was trying to give him the easy way out. The way of avoidance of pain, suffering, difficulty. But Jesus refused. Jesus would stay within the will of Almighty God. And when Jesus resisted Satan, we're told that he departed from him for a season. This demonstrates what we see in James the epistle of James, the fourth chapter, the seventh verse, where it says, Submit yourself before God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from